Dr. Richardson today. Dr. Richardson has been at this institution probably 30 years or more. 23. 23 years. Um, it seems like 30 so far. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, he actually will be leaving us soon to go to the University of Oklahoma. Um, but we've had the pleasure of him being the founding director of the Barshop Institute here at uh, UTESCA and um, he has, he's world renowned in his um, age research focusing on oxidative stress and dietary restriction and he has received numerous um, national and international awards for his research and I've been very lucky to work very closely with him for the last seven years so I'm going to be really sad when you leave but we are very lucky to have him today to present an overview of rapamycin and its effects on longevity. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I want to start out by asking, who are the geriatric fellows? Are there any here? We just have one. Okay, because I'm going to ask. I'm going to be asked some questions. Oh, also, geriatric. <laughs> okay. 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 Because I, I I specifically wanted to. Uh, give this talk because it, at the end it's going to be slanted because I've got a, a pet peeve that I want to address and uh, so but what I want to talk about is rapamycin I know you've heard about it from Dave Sharp and other people and what I'm going to try to do is give you what we've done here as a group from a, a major grant and also other people so that you can have a feeling for you know, you're going to be hearing about this, is, is it uh, uh, an anti-aging drug or this sort of thing. And I'm going to try to give you at least what I see is the facts. I, I am a little bit biased, but I'm not as biased as our Senator Cruz. I would like to add that. So I, 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 I'll try to stick with the facts uh, as much as I can. Okay, so um, and it may be at the end that I may have to jump over the negative side effects, but it's only. But I'll come back on those of the questions. So I, I, I want to point that out. Okay. So I want to give you a little bit of history. You've probably heard of this before, but rapamycin was discovered back in the early 70s, and it was interesting because it was part of a, a Canadian Navy expedition because they were trying to get plants and bacteria from Easter Island because they were going to put in an, an airport a new, and so it would be internationalized and so they wanted to get those fauna that were unique to uh, 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 new, uh, uh, Easter Island. And I point that out because this was not a drug discovery or anything. This was kind of all basic scientists and science wanting to get this. Well one of the things they found was one of the bacteria they found but they produced an agent that prevented the growth of fungi. And they got all excited because there are not a lot of antifungal agents. Mm -hmm. And so that's how the interest started it, and start, they started looking at it. So in the 80s, they discovered the structure. And I'm, I'm a chemist, so I always have to show structures. But the structure tells us two important things to keep in mind. First, it's a large rings type structure. And you, by looking at it, you get the feeling that it'll be insoluble in water, which it is. It's not soluble in water. The other thing with these ketones and stuff, it's somewhat unstable, too. So it's insoluble water and it's somewhat unstable, particularly in light. Okay. The other important thing was that in 91, uh, so I should back up here, is along this line, they said, found that they were using it as a an antifungal agent, and they found out, well, it also inhibited the growth of mammalian cells. And so this is something that prevents the growth of eukaryotes. So they kind of got less and less interested in it as an antifungal when they found that it actually affected uh, 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 the growth of uh, mammalian cells. The big thing came in 91 when they discovered what rapamycin was doing. And this is kind of an interesting thing. This is a pathway they discovered because they found this compound that would prevent the growth of uh, fungi. And so rapamycin binds to a small peptide, which then binds to this large molecule of protein that's called TOR. Um, and it, just for target of rapamycin is what TOR stands for. Now, uh, uh, what we know now in the last 20 years, actually last 10 years, 
This tor is part of a tor signaling pathway or nutrient signaling pathway. This pathway has become huge. And what this pathway is important in, and I always thought of this when I was a graduate student and a uh, young faculty member, is how do cells sense, uh, sense the environment and know when to grow and when not to grow? This tor signaling pathway is the way. So what this does, and there's two complexes. Don't have to really worry about that right now. But there's two part pathways. And so what happens is the cells sense nutrients primarily through amino acid levels. So when the amino acids levels get low, it turns off this pathway. When it gets high, it turns it on. So, what, so this pathway sends amino acids. It also sends growth factors, such as IGF, uh, that are circulating in the blood for mammalian systems. So when cells, in other words, it's a way for the cell to say, hey, I should grow or nutrients, or conditions are such that I shouldn't go. So what happens is, downstream of this, to make it simple, is if the TOR signaling is turned on, the cells grow and they divide. If it's turned off, they don't grow and they don't divide. The other thing that happens is, what you would expect with respect to starvation, is if the cell thinks it's starving, it will basically start De degrading proteins so that they can be used as a source of energy. So it does two things, basic things. It does more than that, but I'm symbolizing this messy table. Is it controls growth. In other words, if, if there's plenty of nutrients around, the cell's growing, and it's not degrading protein by a pathway we call autophagy. No, that's how they do it. If there's limited nutrients around, the cells don't grow and you start breaking down. The cells think they're starving. And so we think the bacteria evolved this to fool fungi that they were competing with in the environment. So the little bacteria would produce rapamycin. The yeast or the uh, micro, the other fungi would see this and say, oh, even though there were plenty of nutrients around, the rapamycin would make the cells think that there was starvation. And so they wouldn't grow. And so the little bacteria would take off. So that's important to keep at the basis because we'll kind of come back to that when we're talking about its function. So in 99, FDA approved the use of serolimus, which is the uh, commercial name for uh, rapamycin, for use in transplants. Because along this line, remember, I told you they, they realized it was anti, not an antifungal, it affected the mammalian cells. And they thought that this also might affect the immune cells because they need to grow and divide. And so that was part, and remember this, part of the cocktail for transplant patients to prevent the rejection of the tissue. What you want to keep in mind is part of the cocktail is not the most in, uh, uh, important or, or harmful uh, 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 immuno uh, prevention agent. In fact, it's added to prevent some of the side effects of cyclosporine that's usually used. Um, so that's where it was used initially. Uh, it's now used in drug uh, living stents. Um, and it uh, can be used as a therapy in renal cancer. And where I think it's going to be its uh, real interest in using in cancer is in the reoccurrence of cancer. And there's a study in breast cancer, and there's a study in uh, renal cancer. Patients that have been treated, either renal cancer surgically removed, or uh, 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 breast cancer treatment. And then what they would do is, as you know, the cancer parents, patients are going to have this potential for reoccurrence. And what they've shown in a first study in breast cancer patients, that including rapamycin as part of the follow-up therapy, will prevent the reoccurrence. And think of it, this kind of makes sense because what we know rapamycin does, it slows down the growth of cells. So if you had they will see cancer cells around if you're taking rapamycin, you would predict you would slow them down and therefore slow down the incidence of cancer. Okay, so I think rapamycin is going to really come on in the cancer field, not only to prevent this, but for individuals that have uh, uh, genetic predispositions for some cancers. Okay, now the big thing in aging came up, and you've probably seen this slide many times ago, uh, about three or four years ago. when. Uh, uh, Dave Sharp was actually the uh, 
uh, mind behind using rapamycin to slow down aging. Uh, and uh, Randy Strong was very in involved in this project. And what they showed, that they, when they gave mice rapamycin, either males or females, it increased lifespan. This is about 10 to 15 percent. You say, well, that's not much, but the interesting thing is, that's how much you would increase lifespan if you prevented all cancer and all heart disease. So from a human standpoint, it is substantial. The other interesting thing that was probably the most important from a gerontology standpoint is it would work when it was implemented late in life. This would be analogous to about a 60-year-old individual. So you don't have to take this throughout life like caloric, caloric restriction. Subsequently, it was re repeated starting rapamycin earlier in life. Uh, of the mice, and you saw roughly the same curves. One of the things that you kind of see reoccurring is effect is always on lifespan is always greater in females. There are sex effects on many parameters uh, with respect to rapamycin. About that time, another group with another strain of mice gave rapamycin. This is where they were giving it other every other day. But all the previous ones and all of them that I'll be talking about, they give rapamycin in a uh, uh, enteric coated. Uh, delivery system, so you can feed it as part of the food. This one, they basically injected it every other week uh, over the lifespan. And they increased the lifespan of uh, another strain of mice. This is a study that we just completed that's in press. And uh, this is black six mice often uh, used. And again, we see its effect on both males and females. And that's kind of unusual because many manipulations that work, except for caloric restriction, Genetic manipulations work in just one sex or another, and that's seen in Drosophila humans. So this is also unique in the sense that it works in both males and females, although it's always better in males, I would say. Um, and there's been a paper published just this year where they can, uh, saw the same thing in black six mice in males, where it increased lifespan. And this is a study that's going to just come out. This is again by the intervention testing program. And in this case, they basically used three concentrations. The dose that they used originally is 14 parts per million in the food. And this is what I'm going to be talking about. They reduced it and they went up. And the surprising thing in my mind, because you're always hearing about the toxicity of rapamycin, they've increased it threefold. And it's, if anything, it's even getting slightly better. Uh, results with respect to lifespan. In females, you can even get this effect at the low dose. In males, it peters out. So again, this even shows better the, the, the difference uh, in lifespan. Now, I've gone through that uh, away. So one of the questions that you oftentimes have when you're looking at this lifespan data is, and you'll see it, although they don't usually talk about it when they publish it, is that the levels of rapamycin are pretty high in these mice that they're looking at. So this gives you the rapamycin levels in uh, this study that I just reported. And this is the 14 parts per million that was used initially and that most people use. And, and in this background of mice, and this is a kind of a four-way cross, so it's a very mixed background, which is good in many respects. These animals have about 13, it averages around 13 nanograms per million in the blood. In humans, you're looking at the target range of 3 to 10. So uh, so this is a little bit on the high end. But you can see is they've gone up to uh, a threefold higher to almost uh, 40 to 50 nanograms per mil, which would be three times higher than the therapeutic range in humans. And the uh, lifespan has increased further. Now, in our study, where we use black 6 because of strain differences, this is, is totally unexpected is we found that at the same dose, this dose here, while well, they had about an average of 13.4 nanograms uh, per mil uh, in the blood, we had around four, range from 1.5 to 10. And the, what I want to emphasize is this is roughly the dose that we're talking about that's used in humans. So everything I'm going to be talking about that we see in mice are, is observed at a dose that's used in humans. Now that still doesn't mean that it will occur across, but at least we're not talking about a dose that's way over what well, would be expected to be used in humans. Although, I don't, I doubt that there's been a study where they looked at 
high doses in, in humans. So I honestly don't know what they've done. I, I know that people usually stay around this is the, the highest dose they use. And this is using the cancer uh, treatments. So we know that rapamycin, I just showed you, increased the lifespan. But there's been also studies. This is a progeria knockout mice that has uh, cardiac problems it, in short life, but it increases their lifespan. There are four strains of mice that get cancer. They've increased their lifespan. Thus, in the last four years, there's been 14 different animal model studies where they've shown an increase in lifespan. This is very robust. Usually you see one person sees it, then another person, and you go through this. This is really uh, uh, excellent. But there are two exceptions. One exception is that in, uh, Holly looked at the uh, ALS mice, and it, these are short-lived, and the ALS mice do not show any effect. And I think this is probably, my guess is that of all the tissues, I think rapamycin probably has the least effect or potential for a negative effect, maybe. I, I, I would just say potential because I, there's no evidence on uh, skeletal muscle. Not heart, though, but skeletal, maybe. That, uh, keep that. The other thing is Cassineth is just in the process of uh, publishing this data. He looked at rapamycin in obese mice. And the reason he was looking at that is he had data for short-term administration of rapamycin in diabetic animals. And it prevented the uh, 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 buildup of the matrix in kit. It looked like it might prevent uh, renal disease in uh, 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 diabetics. And so we thought that if we gave our fat mice here, uh, rapamycin, we would uh, improve renal uh, outcomes and they would live longer. But what uh, Cassie has seen is that actually, this is the rapamycin animals. They actually, this, the death is similar here, but you can see that as you get in the last half of lifespan, uh, you can see it's that, uh, uh, the rapamycin animals are dying. Now the interesting thing, keep in mind, is that a normal mouse that's not uh, this uh, DVD strain, the normal mouse here that wasn't like this, at 800 days would have about 15% uh, of the animals would die. So, so in other words, they live way out here. So these are a short life animal. And we're really not sure why these are dying. I don't think, at first we thought these might have had complications with uh, uh, insulin resistance and diabetes, but the blood sugar levels are no different. So we're not really sure why these animals are dying, although we've looked at the pathology. Uh, okay, so one of the things that I want to emphasize here is that these studies with rapamycin were the first to show that there might be the possibility to have a drug that would slow down aging. Now that might not seem too fantastic to you folks, but for 30 years, every time I talked to a news person, they would say, well, when are you going to get a pill that slows down aging? And I would do the song and dance where you don't want to have it too long or they're not going to fund you and you don't want to have it too short. So I always say, oh, about 10 years, because in 10 years, Nobody remember what you said. Now, actually, five years, and they don't remember what you said. So, so, uh, but to be frank, up until about three years ago, I honestly never thought that they would find a drug that would have an anti-aging effect during my professional career, and maybe even during my lifetime. I thought it would be possible because it's not that aging is something that's special. It's just more complex than diseases and stuff. And so by kind of stumbling across this, we show much like antibiotics, I think of this as antibiotics. Now everybody, you have a bacteria, you see, run out and get an antibiotic. You know, back in the 30s and 40s, they never had, so it was really, penicillin was a magic bullet. This is a little bit like that in the sense that we've shown with the mouse models that we can essentially uh, increase lifespan. So, the question is, is this slowing down aging? And that's what I'm going to talk about the rest of the time. I'm going to talk about the experiments that's been done here through a major grant that I was a PI of, but that was done by other investigators across the campus to asking if it slowed down aging. Now, what questions would you want? In other words, we know it increases lifespan, but is that enough? What else would you ask if you wanted to slow down aging? What would you say that I needed to answer? 
the one geriatrics fellows down here. Can you give me something that you want to know? Yeah, I would like to know how this drug would affect, uh, you know, if, if you would slow down aging, how would that affect the normal aging process? Like, well, what, what side effects are? Well, side effects would be, but if, if, if it slowed down aging, what would you say that you would quickly, that you would see? Less um, disease, diseases. right? So you say, and that's one of the things that we looked at. Does it reduce or delete disease? And what would be the active thing that you look at? Do you have physiologically improvement? In other words, are you frail or these sorts of things? So the other thing that we ask is does rapamycin improve health span? And by health span, we're using, you could say, physiological decline. So it's, the health span is kind of better. And so health span would be, you could look at muscle function, cognition, all of these. The, decline with age. So if you're slowing down aging, not only do you live longer, but the key, and that's the importance really of an aging intervention, is the fact that you're going to have an effect on most age-related disease processes and most functions of decline with age. And that's important because that's the way that we will sell aging research to the congressmen. The interesting thing that nobody talks about, and there's data out there, is that if you cure or prevent all of cancer and all of heart disease, people live about 10 years longer, which is about what you see with rapamycin in the mice. But the key is, it's more costly. And as the geriatricians should know, is that if you don't die when you're 70 from a heart attack, and you live five more years, and you have Alzheimer's, or you break your hip and you go into a nursing home, you start talking about big bucks. Mm -hmm. And that's the real thing that people don't quite get. In other words, you could, it's some, one of, uh, I was talking to a public meeting, and this was an older person, he says, why do we need to have more old people around? So they kind of think <laughs> that if we're keeping, we just have more nursing homes. And what you would have, your argument would be, is there would be less people in the nursing home, because they would be, uh, 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 more healthy, longer. Okay, so one of the first things we looked at was cancer, but there was a lot of data out there. So this is data where they're looking at cancers in various mouse models. And there are these 12 reports that show that rapamycin had a reduced effect on various aspects of cancer. So it has a very broad effect on cancer, and it's very robust. And these are studies that you've probably seen that Dave Sharp reported where he looked at two animal models of cancer. I, these, I don't know what kind of cancer they get, but these animals get a, 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 a cancer of the gastrointestinal tract that's very similar to what you see in humans. And the red curve is the rapamycin, and you can see it has a dramatic effect on lifespan of the mice. And so this has been very constant. And that's why I said, is I think rapamycin is going to be uh, something that you're going to hear more and more about from the cancer. But the important thing that you folks as geriatricians should be thinking about is these cancer people, all they give a damn about is do they have cancer or don't they have cancer? And the question really is, do these individuals that are getting rapamycin show improvement in other functions that are occurring with age? Okay. Uh, now the other area is uh, atherosclerosis. Now the mice don't generally develop atherosclerotic plaques. But you can genetically manipulate it by knocking out the APOE gene or the LDL receptor gene, and they will develop uh, 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 atherosclerosis. And there were very short-term studies where they injected rapamycin, and they showed that this reduced the development of atherosclerotic plaques. Now, uh, uh, Rito Asmus at our group then looked at uh, feeding rapamycin to mice over eight months. This might seem like a short term, but if you were looking at a portion of the lifespan, this would be like a roughly a 20-year study in humans. So this is a significant amount of time. And so he took about four-month-old animals, which would be a little bit like college age, a postdoc age animals, <laughs> and fed them rapamycin for uh, the next uh, roughly uh, five to uh, 20 years of their life. And he then scored the development of these plaques in the aortic arch. And what you can see is that rapamycin, which is shown in the black here, 
rapamycin significantly reduced the buildup of uh, 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 aortic plaques. Now, you know, you look at that and it says, okay, it's, it has this effect, but it's nothing to write home to your mother about. But one of the things that's interesting is the rapid levels in these mice were very low, about one-fourth what we normally see. And yet these are the, roughly in the same background. They just have this knockout. We think what's going on here is that because we're feeding them a high-fat diet, it interferes with rapamycin. So based on what we've seen thus far, is I'm predicting that if you jacked up and used the higher doses, you might get even a better effect. When we were doing this, we used this because we were afraid that 14 parts per million was maximum. If we went any higher, we would. Now we know that from this you can triple the concentration and have no effect on lifespan. So it would be interesting to look at this. Now, there's been two other groups that looked at cardiac function feeding rapamycin. And this is one where they took these mice that uh, develop uh, are, are short life because they have cardiac problems. And when they gave them rapamycin, not only did they live longer, but it improved cardiac function, certain cardiac function. The other one that's very interesting from Peter Rabinowitz's group in uh, uh, Washington, they took older mice. And these were mice, I think, at least over 18 months of age. And they gave them rapamycin for around six months. And they found an improvement in several functions that declined with age. So, uh, so from the limited amount of data at the present time, I would say that it would not, I would say for sure that it's going to have an effect on atherosclerotic plaques. Exactly how it's doing this, we don't know. One of the things we think that it may be reducing inflammatory cytokines, but we don't know how it's working here. With cancer, I think it's really easy to say it's primarily through proliferation. And exactly what it's doing here with uh, cardiac function, we don't know. But the studies here would suggest definitely it would have uh, an effect on atherosclerosis in mice. And in mice, it appears that it improves uh, cardiac function. There's no evidence in any of the studies. There's a few other studies that saw no effect on measures of cardiac function, but they never have seen any detrimental effects. Okay. So one that we were really interested here, and that's probably the reason that Don came here, you know, he says, finally, you've gotten to something that's interesting, is uh, the Alzheimer's. And as, as you probably know, is now Alzheimer's has jumped up as one of the highest, uh, most uh, costly diseases. But we wanted to know, would rapamycin affect the progression of Alzheimer's? In this case, there was no evidence, information out there on the effect of rapamycin on not only Alzheimer's, but memory. Well, I, I back up. There were one or two studies in normal mice that suggested that rapamycin would have a negative effect on memory. And it would make sense because it does affect protein synthesis, which is involved in memory. And so when we were doing this study, Dave Sharp and I were joking and said, well, maybe we really should do this because this is going to be where our luck runs out, we're going to see a negative effect. And so I always jokingly say, now how do you get somebody to do an experiment that you think is not going to turn out well? And the way you do that <laughs> is you get junior faculty. <laughs> and the junior faculty, oh, they'll do anything. They're very optimistic. You get the old time and they'll explain all the reasons that you don't want to do that experiment. So, so Salvo and Veronica came roughly about the same time in, in 2009-10. And they're looking at, the important thing is they're looking at two different models of Alzheimer's, the mouse models. Uh, and Salvo's model actually develops uh, 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 not only the, the amyloid deposits, which is common, but he also develops these uh, tangles that are involved in tau. They take their mice at slightly different inches, but this is when the mice are pretty much normal, but they know in the next two to three months they'll see cognitively declines. So the big question is, and this would be, again, this three months would be like about five years in human beings. So we know that in this time, if you take a normal mouse, they'll uh, show decline in cognition. Now, how in the world do you get a mouse to fill out a mini mental test? That's what I want to know. Well, so here's where, you know, it, you're, it, you always say, is this really the same as humans? So they're looking at the, the common t 
test that when you're using mice, they'll talk about is the Morris water maze test. So you take a mouse, you put it in a tub of water. There are cues around here, but you have a platform. Mice, uh, rats don't work very well because rats like water. Mice don't like water. So they basically want to find uh, 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 the platform. And so you have this platform hidden, but after a while they figure out where the platform is. And then you came back, come back, and when you retest them, they go right for the platform. Now, the way that you test whether they remember or not, you put them in and you remove the platform and see how long they are searching in the right area for the platform. Now, I always wondered whether this really was analogous to looking at Alzheimer's in humans, but Veronica told me, that, and it makes sense because my mother has Alzheimer's and I've seen it. In other words, one of the things that you lose with Alzheimer's is the spaceship. In other words, knowing where you're at and going. I, my mother, in the nursing home that she lives, they have the uh, dining room. And then they have off of three corridors, and hers is in the, mid, off in the middle corridor. It's a little bit like a, a, a maze test that they have for rats, actually. <laughs> and so I always amazed when I visit her. She'll get up, and she has no idea which corridor or which direction to go. Even when I get her in the corridor, she doesn't know her uh, room. So I think that there's a little bit analogous uh, to this. Uh, in other words, that's kind of a, a real key uh, uh, component uh, of, of memory that's important. And so there, I think that this is really kind of measuring uh, a key, uh, an important component. And you can argue about whether it, it is or not. But I think it has the potential. Now, I'll, I'm going to show you here a real-time study. Now, these are the Alzheimer's mice that are just fed a regular diet. And, then, and these mice have, have gotten to the point where they uh, don't have any memory. Remember, the pla uh, platform is here. Now, these are the mice that were fed rapamycin. Remember, the platform is right here. So, bingo, that guy goes for it. This guy is still looking for it. Who knows where? So, so what they do is they measure the amount of time they're looking for the platform in the right quadrant. That's what they do here. And so the more time they spend on this, the better their score. So this just shows you non-transgenic mice given rapamycin or not. Remember, this is kind of important because we were afraid just giving normal mice rapamycin would interfere with their memory. It has no effect. In this case, it's not significant, but it looks like it's even improved. Remember, these again are young mice that uh, uh, have been fed rapamycin roughly for about two to three months. Okay, now, these are mice that are transgenic mice that have Alzheimer's. And so you can see that they perform much worse on this test. Now, the key is how do they perform when they're given rapamycin? And you bring it right back up to where it was in the normal animals. That's three months testing. And so one of the questions we had when it came up, I asked Selvo, I said, well, you know, you know, if you went longer, would you lose the rapamycin effect? And so what he did was he did a study where he took his mice and he took two-month-old animals, this is before they developed rapamycin, and fed them for 16 months. So this would be a long time. And asked, you know, would it prevent the uh, decline in uh, memory? And this just shows your transgenic mice and the rapamycin that were fed 18 months are performing just as well as the controls. Now, one of the things that we did in this study uh, also that I don't show here is we also asked, what if we started this late in life? Could we rescue this effect? After, they, in other words, remember, all of our studies with the mice, we know that they're going to get Alzheimer's. So we started early. You can't do that with patients. That's one of the problems, you know. So the question we had is, what if we start this? Instead of at two months, we started at, I think he started at, uh, uh, he started at 15 months. So the, the plaques and tangles in the brain were built up. At that time, he didn't show an effect. Now, I'm not sure whether, it, you know, it's, that was not unexpected, but I would like to do it with higher concentrations. And I'd also like to back it up to, you know, when like six or eight month old animals, when we can see the deficit earlier on, can we reverse them? In addition, what he's seen, as you know, you've got plaques and tangles are features of Alzheimer's. And so he looked at uh, the levels of A beta, 
uh, uh, this is the amyloid po uh, portion uh, that uh, essentially uh, forms the aggregates. And this shows that the brown uh, uh, staining material is the A beta. And you can see that it's reduced. And we think that's primarily because rapamycin boosts up autophagy to break down the proteins. So that goes along with the concept of what we think is happening here. And what was great here is he also was able to use a, a dye that this is actually a measure of the aggregates themselves. These are measure of the, the protein amount. But this shows you that it's reduced the aggregates in the brain. And he's also looked at tangles here. And he's seen that the tangles are reduced. Now, the other thing that uh, Veronica did, and she was working with Aileen uh, Lynn, who's over at the Research Imaging, and they can do uh, uh, analysis on uh, the brains of these animals. And so one of the things that you see with Alzheimer's disease is there's a decrease in blood, uh, uh, cerebral blood flow in uh, Alzheimer's patients. And we can see that we see a similar thing in the mouse. In other words, the lighter this is, the more blood flow you have, and the darker it is, the less. And so what we did was we took animals here that, that were uh, going to get Alzheimer's, and we fed them rapamycin, and then looked at the brain, the blood flow. And this is just looking at our uh, Alzheimer's mice that were given control uh, diet. These are mice that had been given rapamycin for probably about four or five months. And you can see that the brain blood flow is improved significantly. This is in the whole brain, and this is in the hippocampus. And the reason they look at hippocampus is they think this is very important in memory. So it's improved brain blood flow. And in addition, they've looked at vascular density in the brain, and the vascular density is improved by rhizomycin treatment. So the real important thing that I think came out of our study was that rapamycin has a very dramatic effect on Alzheimer's in these uh, mouse models of Alzheimer's. It improves memory, it reduces plaques and tangles, it improves cerebral blood flow and vascularization. All four of these are hallmarks of Alzheimer's. Okay, so the question we also had was what effect does rapamycin have on normal wild type mice? And what we found here, much to our surprise, was that if we gave rapamycin and we were looking at function, this is where we gave it for 18 months. This was, I dropped this out of the previous slide, but this is the control mice. And these are the control mice uh, that were fed rapamycin when they're old. And when you fed it throughout, there was a significant improvement in cognition. Veronica has seen the same thing in another mouse model, and then she's looked at passive avoidance, another measure of memory. She sees that in older animals, uh, in other words, in younger animals, not much of an effect. In older animals, she sees an effect. There's been another study that's been reported to show in normal animals that rapamycin, for short term, will improve memory. So I, I, my feeling is, is that, that uh, this is a pretty robust finding in uh, uh, normal mice that we never expected uh, to see. In addition, which was interesting, because Veronica was when, you know, she was, because she was a junior investigator, she was still in helping her assistants do studies with mice, and she kept saying, these rapamycin mice are really uh, very calm. And so she then started looking at anxiety and measures of anxiety and depression in mice. And they can actually do that, whether a mice is depressed, I don't really know. But it's interesting that there was less anxiety and less depression on these measures in mice fed rapamycin. So the punchline I have is, you know, rapamycin I think is going to have a dramatic effect on cancer, uh, maybe a limited effect on heart, maybe no effect on skeletal muscle, but I think the central nervous system is a place that is going to have a much more dramatic effect than we ever thought when we started out on this whole thing. So the last thing was remember, so we found three major age-related diseases, cancer, heart disease, and uh, uh, neuro, uh, Alzheimer's. And there's suggestion that maybe other types of neurodegeneration might be important because it gets, kind of cleans out the brain with aggregates and stuff. That's less uh, obvious right now to me. So the other question that came up is, okay, what about their physiological function? 
Well, we've already talked about cognition is improved. So uh, 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 Steve and, and uh, Kate looked at five different physiological assays. And I'm not going to put them up there, but what uh, we found is that some functions were improved by rapamycin. Others, I would say the majority, had no effect. And, but the important thing is we never, of the, all the functions that we looked at, we never found anything detrimental. So it either improved it or had no effect. We were particularly interested in muscle because there was a study out here from uh, the group at Galveston and they were kind of poo pooing rapamycin because they were talking about it would be bad for your muscle. And there was this study where they looked at rapamycin in humans where they gave rapamycin very short term, and then they looked at protein synthesis and muscle in response to exercise, and rapamycin reduced it. That's exactly what you predict. Uh, but from that, they were making the argument that, well, prolonged taking of rapamycin would be uh, a, a problem, bad for the muscle. And so we wanted to do that. And so in this study, this is a study where we fed the mice, rapamycin them for 21 uh, uh, months. So this would be like 60 years, roughly, uh, in humans. This was a study where they lived longer. So this was a cohort. And we looked at the muscle weight of a variety of muscles. The uh, light blue is, our, uh, light colors are rapa, and the dark colors are the controls. And you can see there is no significant difference in muscle mass. In other words, there's no evidence that it would accelerate the loss of muscle. Unfortunately, in mice, the loss of muscle mass occurs very late in life. So we don't have any, in other words, uh, uh, the loss of muscle, we don't know whether rapamycin would prevent muscle loss that you see with the aging. Uh, uh. But we've looked at grip strength. In females, it's improved with rapamycin. Males, there's no uh, difference. Uh, we've looked at gait analysis with rapamycin. We see that uh, a, a variety of measures, as this is just one, great uh, stride length decreases, it's maintained when the mice are fed rapamycin. And then the favorite that everybody uses is a rotor rod where you have this rod turning and you have the poor little mouse on there trying to stay on it. And this declines with age and rapamycin uh, 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 prevents that decline. So, question, does rapamycin slow down in aging? So all of this research, I think I can conclusively, without any hesitation, say, does it slow down aging? I would say, maybe. <laughs> so this is where I, you know, we talked about it. So what would a manipulation that you would say slow down aging have to, what criteria would you meet? And this is where it depends on whether you're ultra-conservative or you're a wishy-washy liberal to a certain extent. I know, I'm always doing these political analogies. I'm not saying which is better. Okay, so here's what we know. Rapamycin, rapamycin increases lifespan of almost all folks, so you can't argue that from that standpoint. In the old days, that was the only standard we used on whether something slowed down aging. Did it? And so it was very nice. It was a yes or no. As soon as you start talking about disease, as soon as you start talking about function, then you have a problem. Why? Because it delays the pro progression of a number, but not all. It improves some physiological functions, but not all. And it reduces some pathological lesions, but not all. So what happened is, if you're on this one side and says, you've got to have all of these things met before it slows down aging, you would say no. And that was actually what was the decision from a paper that I was asked to write a commentary for JCI. They had done like 150 assays on rapamycin and mice. And they came to the conclusion that it did not affect aging because it did not affect, so it did not affect all processes. Now the other interesting thing is their study and our study suggest there aren't any processes that decline with age that are accelerated by rapamycin. So I've come up with 
In this way, I use the term the Tifonis phenotype. Now, does anybody know who Tifonis was? Played quarterback, I think, for the Bears. No, this is this is a great this is a, it, this is from Greek mythology. They don't ask that on the boards. Anything about no, Greek mythology? No, 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 no. Unfortunately, but you can write a question. Okay, 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 okay. I knew they asked a lot of trivial stuff, so you would have thought that they would ask. That's so, so I, I don't know Greek mythology yes, either. For my wife does. I, didn't he ask to live forever? Yes. And so, so he got his wish? Yeah. No. But, well, what it was, was, was uh, Eos, which was a Greek goddess, fell in love with this Spartan princess. And she realized that, you know, there was this difference, you know, that she was immortal and he was mortal. And so she was in love. She, was, she went to Zeus and said, make him immortal. And so the Greek gods are always, you know, you give them what they ask for, nothing more. So he was immortal, but he yes, yes, forgot to ask for. So Tithonus kept going older and older and more decrepit, and finally she felt so sorry for him, she turned him into a, a grasshopper. So there's nothing uglier than an old grasshopper, I guess. But, so that's the story. So so I think that we can look at this data. And we can say, while we couldn't say, does rapamycin slow down aging, the important thing really that we're asking, because that's what we're worried about when, I mean, uh, geriatricians even, you know, when you talk about uh, living longer and slowing down aging, they immediately say, oh, they're thinking of the thonus who's getting frailer and frailer and weaker and weaker, and they say, you don't want that. I don't want to live forever and be in a nursing home. Or something like that. So, so the question is, I think that we can answer if rapamycin has an effect. So we can ask this question. Rather than saying, does rapamycin slow down aging, we say, do mice that live longer, and we know the mice are living longer, show more pathology, more loss of function, and more disease? Because that's what you predict from the, the thonus phenotype. And the answer to that, I can say this with certainty, is no. All of our studies, as I've seen, shows that there is no evidence these mice are aging more rapidly. They are just as good as the animals. In other words, when we look at them, when they, all of these animals have died, and these animals are still living, they have, essentially the rest of their life, they have as good of a physical output as, as if not improved. So, so my feeling is that it's going to be very, very difficult for this to be able to say that you have an anti-aging drug. But by looking at this, we can say, say that we don't, because I don't think any drug that you've got is going to affect all age-related diseases and it's going to affect all uh, conditions. So I don't think that's going to happen. So I'm going to wind up here with, um, I don't have time to, I told you, I don't have time for the negative effects, so I wanted, uh, but we can talk to, about those uh, in the, uh, uh, okay, so here, so uh, I want to go, where is the, here's the slideshow. Right down, right down here. Oh, it's right down here, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Right. okay. So, where do we go from this? So, we've, we've seen what goes with mice, and we basic researchers tend to think, well, we showed this in mice, jump, let's do it with humans. The problem which I found out, and uh, I, I remember arguing with this, with not arguing, talking with Sarah Sanchez, Riley and uh, Sarah about this, is I said, well, can't we, would, would give this to humans? Because if I had a chance to jump in a study with rapamycin, I'd volunteer. Now, if you're just a private, physician, you could do this on site, but you can't do it, as I understand it, and I've got the experts here, but you can't do a clinical trial with something that has a negative effect on people that are totally healthy like myself. In other words, they just, you can't get that through the IRB. So, as, uh, and I don't know whether Nick's talk, so Nick's trying to get a piggyback onto a cancer study where they're taking it, and then you can ask all these questions. And I think that's the way that we're going to have to look at anti-aging manipulations. Because one thing that I can say for certainty, 
you're not going to have something that slows down aging that has no side effects at all. So where did we go from here? Well, it, it's uh, uh, to particularly looking at lifespan, it's a long ways from go to humans. But we can go, perhaps, in an animal model that's closer, primates, non-human primates. Rhesus monkeys live relatively long, but Suzette has a marmoset colony here. And so she's done a study, a year-long study, which would be like six years in humans. And these marmosets have received, they've given them rapamycin every day in yogurt, and they really like it. And what they've, they've had eight rapid-treated animals and five uh, controls where they gave the yogurt without the rapamycin. They started at roughly seven to nine years of age. This would be like a 60-year-old person and went for a year. That would be, in human terms, that would be six years because these animals live only 12 to 15 years. The rapa levels in these animals were five nanograms per mil, roughly what we had in our mice and in the range of humans, remember? This, so this is what we would see in humans. So this would be a study where we've done like a six-year study uh, if we were in human terms, a one-year study here. And so we looked at it, this portion of the lifespan. And the reason I show you that is because we don't have lifespan data. But we know in this part we would expect deaths. And based on the lifespan data, we would predict that there would be two out of the eight animals would have died. And one, and we've got to find that quarter of a mouse, <laughs> uh, or uh, uh, marmoset that died. So we would see t three to, around three animals in the whole group uh, died. So what did we actually see? We see one rapamycin died, then two in the control. Now, you, of course, I saw this and I got excited and Suzette, who's not nearly as excited, said, you can't say anything from that. And I said, well, you know, I can, I, what we can say one thing. A year treatment had no I, a, a, a disadvantage, and possibly an advantage. But the key here is we were able to deliver it to marmosets. We had the same concentration and we didn't see any negative side effects. So what I want to end with now is where we go, because this is where I want to talk to you folks that are geriatricians. The Monica Mita, who is an oncologist who used to be here and was one of the first who's looking at rapamycin before it's gotten popular. She was doing a lot of studies with pharmaceutical uh, companies with different uh, rapalogs. What she says here is we all have seen patients being benefiting from the treatment with rapalogs and doing remarkably well for a prolonged time with almost no change in quality of life. And then she goes on and says, we are very familiar with the toxicity profile and we believe they are self safe and compatible with prolonged use. She has a patient who was in their 60s and has been on rapid, some sort of cancer and has been on it for seven or eight years uh, without any, uh, to be frank, she didn't do a uh, workup, but at least the patient has no uh, follow-up cancer. So the, what I want to say here, what has really surprised me from the geriatric community is that I thought when we saw this, we would have all of you folks jumping out and saying, what can we do to do this? Now, you folks here at San Antonio have been good, but I'm talking about the other group, particularly everyone <coughs> who I will not mention his name, who happens to be the <coughs> division of research. And the first thing they'll say, a lot of people will say to you, well, that might have got all these side effects. Well, yes, it does have, and uh, I, I'll come back to it. But they'll say, uh, and what I said is, it's kind of like saying, if you had cancer, saying, well, that drug's got side effects, you know. I'm, if you're going to do something to age, you're going to have some. I think the other problem is that I think as geriatricians, you have been ingrained with the fact that there's nothing you can do. You're, you're in a system, which is a downside, is you're just kind of following the patients or trying to make life comfortable. And to a certain extent, that's gotten to be the name of the game in pepper centers, to be frank. Mm -hmm. And so there's a whole different, and you also have patients coming in and says, hey, doc, if I take vitamin C or I growth hormone, this, yeah, I want growth hormone. You're, so you're used to all of this crap that you have to put up with, that 
I think what I'm saying is there are things that are coming down the pipe in the next five to ten years that are going to be potential. This rapamycin one, resveratrol, which I don't believe in, would be another possibility, particularly with heart. But metformin is something that might be. So I think there's going to be drugs out there that might have a effect on aging. And so what I would say is for particularly you young geriatricians and the older geriatricians, although we don't really have any old geriatricians anymore, <laughs> uh, is to really think proactively and really look at the possibility of doing this because it's a new era. In other words, you're going to be able to be just as good as those damned oncologists so that you're going to be able to treat patients for age-related diseases. And certainly, one thing that I've been pushing is I think it has a great potential with respect to Alzheimer's. And whether that gets through or not, I don't know. Because the Alzheimer's club is, you know, they're, they're so ingrained with beta amyloid. Well, but I would like to, uh, Arlen, that this is wonderful. I would like to allow at least 10 minutes for the audience to react to Arlen uh, discussion, especially having done here and uh, Jeff is, 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 try to see right. what we can give you feedback or reaction also the young clinicians and the scientists and how we react to that statement. Are, are we ready to take a challenge and see how this RAPA will go and I mean we went to Korea and no match in RAPA in Korea in the world. There, right. there is no there right. for dementia. So any, any comments Don I would like that you... Well uh, I don't know about anybody else here but I've actually given rapamycin to Alzheimer's patients and it didn't help any of the four or five that I've tried. But because I was kind of afraid of it, I was restricting it to people who had already failed right. conventional treatment yeah. and been pretty advanced. And I uh, think that... And I your think data that, shows that, right? Well, Too late, it won't make yeah, a yeah, difference. Yeah, but he's not... I mean, I'm talking about, you know, nursing home yeah. visits. Exactly. But, mm -hmm. uh, but nobody had any side effects from it. Yeah. Then, uh, so I think did. Arlen may not appreciate all the obstacles that we have to do that. So, because that's not FDA approved, then insurance won't reimburse right. it. Right. So, uh, it costs those families of two to five thousand dollars a month to go through that treatment. Right. Mm. And uh, so, not just anybody's going to be able to put up the cash for that. And then the second thing is that uh, uh, if you tried to uh, do it as a clinical trial because it is off-label, then uh, you can't bill Medicare for treatments that are experimental under, and they use IRB protocol as a way to define that. So mm -hmm. if you have an IRB protocol, then you have to come up with the funds to pay for the treatment. And so where would I get those? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 right. I, I didn't appreciate so all not, of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's not yeah. so easy as yeah. just it's off-label. You yeah. can. But, uh, but I the also VA can see has that a new policy. It's it's actually making us file out <laughs> reports for off label use of anything for any reason. Yeah. So uh, so there are, yeah. you know it's basically yeah. a whole lot more paperwork, no IRB coverage, yeah. uh, risk to the patient, and they have to pay out right. of pocket. Right. Right. Uh, but on the other hand, I think Obama is giving a lot of dollars for the first time in history to Alzheimer's disease research. And I think that that's where maybe in the political arena there are opportunities to say in a disease where we haven't had anything since 2003 yeah. as a breakthrough, yeah. this is something yeah. that potentially could be discussed in pressure to Medicare. Again, it's the seven leading cause of death and it moves up and down. I bet it's going to become more going down to maybe get support at least to certain Don, centers. One of the things that Don said is really critical is that I think that that after your patient is in the nursing home or is shown it, it's probably too late with almost any therapy. And so and I know being on the council there's the feeling of having these markers so you can predict. And this was what the if the if Nick was able and that's what really mm -hmm. excuse me. Um, was I we had no traction with that. <laughs> Say, oh God, this is something great. We can combine with cancer. Let's do it. It was, it was. Well, you know, it's got all these problems. You know, and thinking, you know, because with a cancer study, even though it was a year, theoretically the hope was that these they'd have positive results and they would do it longer. And that cancer study 
you would theoretically be able to follow these people if, 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 you, if they would do it, is you'd be able to follow them a long time because you would have started with people that were not, and then would see if at the end if there was a development. So, so I think that, that that's the real, but there's an advantage there because I think that rapamycin is going to get much more popular in use with cancer. And so I think if from the geriatrician standpoint would be to essentially not try to start your own study because Don has pointed out all of the caveats to there. The only way you can get over it is to have some donor that wants to throw a lot of money at you. And so we can cover all of these things. So then all you have to do is pay paperwork. On the other hand, if you do like Nick was going to do, you piggyback onto a study, they've done all of that stuff. They've paid for the drug, they're doing this. All you have to do is piggyback on the study if they'll allow you to do X, Y, and Z. And, and that for Alzheimer's, uh, what I think needs to be done is a randomized clinical trial uh, for people that have uh, early disease or uh, or in yeah, so now they're looking a at milder the disease right. and um, and either have it paid by NIH or the VA or uh, one of the pharmaceutical yeah. companies, Rapa Holdings or the one that makes yeah. Everalimus. Yeah. We write the we write the study and uh, and see who wants to fund it. Surprised that Why they haven't jumped into doing that if they know that this potentially uh, can bring? I don't know because That's particularly weird. the company that has Rapamycin, I can't figure. All I, I have been told with the people that I talk to that are business types is that uh, the business community has gotten burned on a lot of these uh, Alzheimer's yeah, things. Yeah, well, that's the, the next thing is that if if you're saying it's made action in Alzheimer's is through amyloid, 22 consecutive anti-amyloid yep. clinical trials right. have failed, right. and many of them have failed because of unanticipated yep. side effects. And, uh, in the very first one, they uh, vaccinated people against amyloid, mm -hmm. and people developed encephalitis yeah. and died, and they had to halt the study. And uh, But at autopsy, though, it worked. It got rid of all the amyloid in those brains. Mm -hmm. But that had no effect on tangle formation, which advanced anyway in 100% of the cases that have been autopsied so far to the very worst stage of tangle formation which is called a, a Brock stage of six. So uh, completely getting rid of the amyloid, washing it out of the brain had no effect on dementia. Every one of those subjects went to institutionalization and at death as this Brock stage of six. But that might actually be an acceleration of their tangled pathology because in the Honolulu Asia aging study where I've looked at large numbers of autopsies, you know, only 3% of those cases are demented, but 89% have tangles, mm -hmm. right? And so, uh, still, only three individuals in 700 brains have a Brock stage of six. So, even in dementia patients, they don't go to a Brock stage of six, usually. And when you wash out the amyloid, 100% went to a Brock, Brock stage of six. So, but the one thing that I push on the rapamycin because I'm very skeptical of this beta amyloid. This, in other words, this is not necessarily something that was designed to get rid of beta amyloid. It's basically, we think that it's working, it upright, and that's one of the things, but I think it's more than that because of its global effect on the thing. So I think what's happening is you have an anti-aging drug, at least in a sense, and we know that the greatest risk factor for Alzheimer's is aging. And so if we slow down aging and have multiple effects, so I think ex exactly what uh, uh, Don pointed out, I, I think that's an advantage because I don't think that rapamycin, rapamycin does have an effect on beta amyloid autophagy, but it does more than that. It does the tangles and it looks like it has an effect on vascularization that occurs before. And so one of the things that Aileen is looking at that I think is a possibility is treating individuals that have the APOE4 gene that are at greater risk. And these people have show increased, uh, decreased blood, brain blood flow. And so you could do a, theoretically, a year study with these individuals and just use looking at brain blood flow as a measure to see if it would be effective. Now that would not 
have anything to do with memory and stuff, but it would at least get your foot inside the door. Because I think the problems of doing a full-scale test on Alzheimer's and this sort of thing is really difficult. So coming back to the question of the companies, I think the companies are basically looking and, and they're sitting back, it's a capitalistic country, and saying, wait until the scientists tell us there's something and then we'll jump on it, both feet. And so they're saying, why should we invest millions of dollars in the clinical trial and then come up like we did here? We're going to wait and find something. And so it's really frustrating because I think we, I personally think we've got something exciting and that everybody's kind of tippy toeing around with doing it. And, and that's not to say that there aren't these problems. The one thing that I was concerned with is what I saw with Hadley and some of the people this is, well, you know, you've just got all of these problems that rather than looking at maybe this is a new era in geriatrics where we're going to be instead of just treating the symptoms or, or just trying to make life comfortable for people as they sure. age would be that we could have interventions. Uh, and, and I think we're there. We, we will be bringing you back in five years and okay. see where we are. Okay. Maybe at that point we are going to be talking about, thank you so much Arlan for coming and uh, wishing you the best in your retirement. It's always uh, fantastic to have you around. <laughs> no? Oh, I thought that you were, see, okay, del delete that from the <laughs> We love you, so thank you I for coming. And we need to transition to the afternoon, but thank you so much. Okay, well, uh, Dr. Richardson will be outside in the hall. If you wanted to have a question, we're going to just have a couple of minutes to say that Dr. Don Royal, he's going to be speaking about dementia, giving you also some update on what Korea International Conference is coming. So uh, stay tuned. More things to come. Thank you, Jeff. So you need a slide? Do you need a help to set up anything? I'm your IT person. Hey, Thank you for coming. Do you appreciate it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. 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 Oh